Hi, I'm John Quinton from Lancaster University and this afternoon I'm going to be chatting with Dan Richter from Duke University in the US on behalf of the British Society of Source Science. Uh, welcome Dan. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Dan, I thought we'd just kick off by asking you how you got into soil science. What, what got you interested in this, in this topic? Yeah, I was out of, uh, I graduated in philosophy. Wow. And um, went three years without a job and did a lot of fun things. But uh, by the end of the third year, I was really frustrated in a very positive way and uh, decided to go back to graduate school in forestry. Right. But I had such a compelling teacher in soil science, this was in Mississippi, okay. uh, that he, I remember the day where we had a lab in the field and he took us all out of the bus. He knelt down in the soil and talked about this land that had been worked by slaves and by plantation owners and uh, how it was really like the human body, that the soil was an organ just like your skin, the largest organ in the human body, and how important it was and how basically neglected it is worldwide. Mm. I knew there was something to do Needless for me. Do. <laughs> so, so how did that then lead <clears throat> into the research that you, you do now? Oh, it must have led directly into it because yeah. I, I study similar systems in another part of the, of the southeast uh, in South Carolina, uh, which is a region that has been eroded considerably more than Mississippi has been. Uh, and we study the restoration and the recovery of landscapes and soils. And you work on this fantastic <clears throat> long-term yes. soil experiment. Yes, you'd like that's to right. Just tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. So in in Mississippi, I read the soil fertility textbook uh, that goes back to uh, English uh, tradition, the uh, the Russells. Right. Yeah. And. Um, my professor had done a sabbatical at Rothamsted and, and uh, always talked about the Rothamsted data as something special. And I, I arrived in, in my pe present position and a person who had created a Rothamsted-like study, and it was 25 years old at that time, wow. literally gave it to me one day. And he said, maybe you can learn something about weathering. <laughs> <laughs> But you, yes. you've gone on to learn a lot more about soils, yeah. I think, Dan, than yeah. just, just focusing on weathering, I yeah. guess. right. Um, and you've just given a talk to the British Society of Soil Science. and you, Delightful, you, yes. Yeah, you, you picked out three main themes, I guess. And one of those was, interestingly, was soil depth. Yes, right. Could you tell us a bit more about soil depth and why right. that's so important? Yeah, I think, it, I think in the United States, more than in Europe, uh, uh, soil is technically confined to the upper meter, let's say, and uh, we, we uh, struggle with the tension that trees and even crop vegetation root more deeply than one meter, and, and that volume down there is very important to carbon, but water and lots of nutrients. Yeah. Uh, and we tend not to study it. It's hard to study, yeah, actually. that's for sure. But there's opportunity in that as well, and um, the, uh, the soil depth study has provided a lot of uh, traction for my colleagues to, uh, to, uh, to do work in, in a variety of ways. Yeah. So you, you even find soil carbon at depth? And, and, uh, and young carbon, which has been deposited there by recent rooting, uh, is quite influential at depth. It's a huge volume. It doesn't take too much of a change to, to add up to a considerable amount. And yet it's a frontier in terms of science. How much is there? Yeah, so I guess this could be quite important <clears throat> for global carbon balances. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it's, um, m many, many landscapes go in and out of different land uses, and so these deeper depths are are, have, have ebbs and flows in terms of their rooting and in their carbon cycling. Wow, wow. And some of the soils you talked about this, this morning were, what, five, ten meters For deep? sure, yeah. The, 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 the deepest soil it has, that, I, that I am aware of is in Hong Kong, which is a soil saprolite, we call it, saprolite system that's 100 meters deep. What, what's saprolite? So it's, it's uh, weathered rock, but that's chemically weathered, mainly by biogeochemical processes of the vegetation uh, that's perched on the top of this big weathering column. And in Hong Kong, 100 meters uh, above weathering granite. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. 
So one of, one of the other things you talked about uh, in, in your uh, lecture this, this morning was uh, polygenetic soils. So that's soils which are continually f forming in response to, to, to change. And this is a bit different to the, the soil formation I was certainly taught, and me taught too. At, at university. Me too. So it's a bit of a mouthful, polygenetic, but it just means many formation processes. So uh, particularly with human the humanity uh, uh, managing more than half of the soils on Earth. Uh, we have soils that are in, being enriched in carbon and being, being uh, exhausted of their carbon, being eroded and being deposited upon. And so we think of this as, a, as the most recent uh, wave of what we call polygenesis. Uh, and we're, we're struggling and we're excited about trying to figure out the human role in soil formation today. And I guess that brings me on to, to the last component of your, your talk, which, which focused on that human role in, in soil formation. But I guess it also points at the, the need to sustain soils for, for the future and our role in, 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 in doing that. Uh -huh. And so we, um, we, we give a lot of, we, we, give a lot, we, we give a lot of credence. We give a lot of uh, support to sustainability. It's on a lot of people's minds and in people's discussion. But I think about the soil and what it means to, for a soil that's managed to be sustainable. And I think it's quite ironic that we know very little about how a soil changes over the decades as we apply our fertilizers, as we apply our organic matter, particularly in thinking about the whole system uh, through, through a meter or two. Uh, and uh, the little bit of data we have from long-term studies indicates that soils are very dynamic in many processes. So there's much opportunity for students to, to work at long-term research sites and many opportunities for long-term research sites to do better than we're doing today. And these long-term research sites are, are really important, as you say, for understanding some of these longer-term processes, but they're not everywhere in the world, are they? Yeah. That's right. They're, they're, they're mostly in, in North America and in Europe, of course. Uh, but there are quite a few scattered here and there, even in Africa, South America. Uh, there are quite good ones that are, that are uh, actually vulnerable to loss, but ought to be some way or another supported, uh, particularly in prospect of trying to feed 9 billion people, uh, and a large fraction of that food is going to be coming from um, from, man, from landscapes that are being managed, uh, like are being tested in these, in many of these studies. So that's, that's one of the <clears throat> challenges, I guess, we face as soil scientists. Are there any other challenges that you think soils or soil science faces in the next, uh, in the next 10 years or, or so? Yeah, I think that uh, c making connections with related fields is very important. And I think you've probably done it better here in Lancaster than in many places in, in which soil scientists are, are made to feel and to be parts, parts of uh, teams of scientists that range from hydrology to, to uh, botany to geology to atmosphere. Uh, this is very important for, for, for soil science to make the transition from its agronomic roots uh, into this broader field of the environment. Great, Dan. That's, that's been really interesting. Thanks, thanks very much.